you don't know, my name's Aaron Huppert. I'm a physical therapist and physician liaison at H&D Physical Therapy. Um, welcome to another installment of the webinar series. Uh, tonight, we're super excited because it's a little departure from our normal topics. Um, and um, I will introduce our panelist and host in a minute. Um, but first, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background of uh, what we're all about and how we got to this um, topic. So um, many of you are maybe tuning in for the first time. We've been doing this webinar series for the last uh, nine months, really, since the pandemic began um, as a way to reach out to our community, realizing that it was not so easy for everybody to come in to the clinic um, for their usual physical therapy sessions. So in addition to offering telehealth services, which we still do, we decided to partner with the best and brightest physicians and physical therapists in our community to help you navigate through some of the physical challenges that we're all facing during this time. So topics have ranged from alternatives to surgery, to biomechanics of bike, bicycling, to how to improve your balance and proper economics, working at home, um, all to make sure that you stay healthy on your own. Um, so, um, tonight's topic is uh, very uh, relevant, um, as you know. Um, we, uh, the, the title is Maximizing Your Heart Health in the Age of COVID-19. So even in the context of this global pandemic, heart disease continues to be okay. the greatest health threat yes. Americans sure. are facing. Um, in addition to being in lockdown, it's made it difficult for everyone to access healthcare as a way to engage in healthy behaviors to help them protect from illness and promote health. So tonight we have Noah Greenspan, who is the cardiopulmonary physical therapist at H&D Physical Therapy and founder of Pulmonary Wellness Foundation. He's gonna help discuss and take questions on lifestyle strategies to minimize your cardiac risk and maximize your heart health and wellness during this pandemic. So topics will range from improving and maintaining your cardiovascular health, cardiac screening, risk stratification and modification, and the role of exercise, nutrition, stress, and anxiety management. <laughs> so our, um, our host tonight is, um, is Noah Greenspan, who is, uh, as I said, a board certified cardiovascular and pulmonary physical therapy specialist. He's the director of the Pulmonary Wellness Foundation at h and Physical Therapy, and the author of Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness. Um, and, um, Without further ado, I would like to introduce Noah as he um, takes it away here. And Good evening, everybody. So welcome to uh, the first cardiopulmonary at H&D. So um, I want to talk tonight about a lot of different things, but most importantly, um, you know, I know Aaron said it's going to be recorded. That doesn't mean take a snooze during, during the talk. Pay attention. Um, and I want to, um, I would like for every single person here to leave with an idea as to one thing they can change in their lives to make their lives better. And you may leave with five things, you may leave with 10 things, but sometimes if you even change one thing and it's the right thing, your life can get significantly better. So as Aaron said, you know, this is such a challenging time in healthcare for so many different reasons. I mean, obviously, you know, for the past 30 years, I've been doing cardiopulmonary rehab, but for the last year, we've been talking COVID, 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 COVID. That's all we talk about. But the idea is that this is Heart Health Month. And despite COVID, heart disease and cardiovascular disease is still, um, is still the number one killer. And that means that, you know, there's a lot of challenges here. So what are the challenges? First of all, we're inside, right? So for some of us, exercising may be that much more difficult. For some of us, exercise may be easier. Maybe now we have a wealth of time and now we're exercising more than ever. So at the beginning of the pandemic, I was exercising more than ever. Then I was exercising less than ever. Now I'm starting to exercise again. Same with eating, right? So some of us are eating worse. Some of us are eating better. Um, but there are things you can do. And sometimes it doesn't have to be a radical change um, for you to improve the quality of your life to number one, prevent problems, right? They say an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure. And when it comes to the heart, the, nothing could be further from the truth. 
And I love the doctors that work just as hard on the front end of a heart attack because anybody can pick you up after you fall down the stairs and have a heart attack, right? We wanna make sure that you are staying healthy, preventing a heart attack, and most heart disease is treatable if you stay on top of it. So I would like for this to be a discussion. Feel free to ask questions. Again, I want everybody to leave with something. Now, I like order when it comes to taking care of patients. And the basic order that I typically follow with things is I start with structure and function. Structure and function is anatomy and physiology, right? Because if you don't have a basic understanding of the anatomy, well, then when doctors start saying things like mitral valve, tricuspid valve, left ventricle, right ventricle, pulmonary artery pressures, it's kind of like a big mismatch in our head. And it's kind of like Charlie Brown's teacher and people start talking to us and doctors start talking to us. And it's kind of like, wah, 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 wah. and then we get home and your friend says, well, what did the doctor say? And you say, I don't know. Right. But the thing is that if you don't know what they said and you don't understand what the, you know, so you don't understand what's good, you don't understand what's wrong, then how are you going to know what to do about it? Right. And I think that most of us very often will leave a physician's office with kind of a vague idea of what's going on. Right. And there's a lot of factors that determine how well or how poorly we understand what's going on. So it could depend on who your doctor is. It could depend on your doctor's knowledge and skill. It could depend on your doctor's bedside manner because a lot of times doctors are very skilled, they're very knowledgeable, but they don't explain things very well. It could also have to do with your understanding and your experience with these things. Um, but also it's very anxiety provoking to go to a doctor. And a lot of times it's like our minds go blank and we know someone's talking to us. We don't quite know what they're saying. And then we get home and we try to put it together where you try to look at the medications and they all look the same or they all sound the same or they all have names like we don't know what to do. So what I really would like is to give you an idea of how you can think about these things. So it's number one, anatomy and physiology. And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, but not a lot because I don't wanna give you a, a doctoral level anatomy lesson. We're gonna talk about pathophysiology of the cardiovascular system and then really talk about screening, okay? signs and symptoms that might give you an idea that, hey, I should go to a doctor, and then things that you can do to, number one, prevent yourself from getting sick, to take care of yourself if you do get sick, and to help you rehab if you do have a cardiac event. Does that make sense? Are there any questions so far? All right, so on a scale of one to 10, show me with two hands, on a scale of one to 10, what would you consider your level of understanding about the heart? Uh, five, Peter Thompson, good, I'm glad you have a 10 because I may have some questions. If I get in a jam, I'm calling on you. A five, a five, a four, a seven, a 10, Linda's also on this, uh, uh, eight, Linda's also on the staff. So anywhere from like on average, I'm seeing a lot of five, sixes and sevens. Uh, Peter is, is my professor. So I'm gonna have, if, if I have any questions, I'm gonna ask him, but think about that. Right. I mean, it's like if you said, well, you know, we're going to ask you to fly this plane. And I said to you, well, how much knowledge do you have about the cockpit? And you were or you went on a plane. And you said, well, how much knowledge does a pilot have about the cockpit? And they were kind of like, well, kind of like five or six or seven. Like who's going in the plane with somebody who's got a seven level understanding of the cockpit? Right. Like we hope they're going to have a 20 level understanding. So the heart is our best friend. And of course I'm biased, but I love the cardiopulmonary system. To me, it's the most beautiful system. Um, it is something that when you understand a little bit about it, things start to make sense. Like I think back to when I played high school football, I had no idea about how the game actually worked. So I wasn't actually good, even though I could have been good. If I could play high school football now, I would be a champion. But the thing is, when it comes to the heart, there are a little knowledge goes a long way. And so I want to start at the very beginning. I want to give you concepts that number one, stand alone, but that also will weave together with the rest of this as we go along so that you leave here and say, you know what? I never thought of that. Or you know what? I have my homework to do. Or you know what? I can start tomorrow by doing something. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not the giant moves. It's not the people who make a total lifestyle change in a radical way that do the best. 
The most important thing is consistency. So I would much rather you make a 10 or 20% change in three or four different areas than to change everything 100% or 200% and you've never exercised before, but this week you're gonna do two hours a night and then you're not gonna be able to move for two weeks, okay? So let's think practically. Let's think about things that we actually can do. Let's think about things that are realistic for us. And we're not looking to go from zero to 100, right? We're looking to get better because everything is relative. So if we're in poor physical health right now, well, then fair physical health would be a step up. If we're in fair physical health, then good physical health would be a step up. If we're in good physical health, then excellent physical health would be a step up or good plus would even be a step up. So those are the things I want you to think about as we go along. So let me talk some basic anatomy and physiology, very basic, don't feel the need to write anything down, just listen and try to understand um, and maybe I'll clear off some cobwebs from you know fifth grade anatomy. So we know that the heart is a four chamber pump, right? And it sits in our chest and it's like if we were cavemen and we put our right hand across, this is about where it would sit and the heart is approximately the size of your own fist, right? So if you're a giant and you have a giant fist, your heart is gonna be you know, bigger than somebody who's like uh, not as big and who's, but essentially this is what the heart does and it pumps. And in fact, the heart is not really just a pump, it's actually two pumps, okay? And the way that I like to think about the heart is the right heart and the left heart the right heart and the left heart, because they do different things. So they're two beautiful pumps that sit next to each other and work together in a way that is really like a synchronized skating routine and it's perfect. So let's talk first about the left side of the heart. So there are four chambers of the heart. There's two upper chambers that are called atria and those are the receiving chambers for blood. There's two lower chambers, which are big chambers, and those are the ventricles, and those are the pumping chambers. The left ventricle is the biggest chamber in the body because the left ventricle pumps blood all over the body. And the purpose of blood, uh, of blood flow and the purpose of circulation is to deliver nutrition to the body in the form of oxygen and to remove waste products in the form of carbon dioxide and other waste products so that you can expel them through the other beautiful system, which is the pulmonary system. So blood enters the left side of the heart, goes from the atrium, goes through the mitral valve to the left ventricle, out to the body, body uses it up, comes back to the right side of the heart, right atrium, goes through the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and then it goes to the lungs. And the reason why the right ventricle is able to be smaller is because it only has to pump a few inches to the lungs where the lungs blow off those waste products and bring in healthy oxygen. Any questions so far? Does that make sense? Do you all have that memorized? All right, perfect. So the heart has three other systems to it, okay? So we talked about the concept of right heart versus left heart. There's another concept and it's a triangle. And this is a, a symbol, you may not know this, but I taught this symbol to Jay-Z many years ago and he now uses this in his concerts, but there's three parts of the heart, okay? Number one is there's the electrical system, right? If you, if you know what I'm talking about, raise your hand. So how many people have heard of the electrical system of the heart? All right. Peter, Tom, okay, just making sure you're not sleeping on me. There's the mechanical system of the heart. How many people have heard of this? And the circulatory system of the heart. Right? Okay. So now here's the thing. When we talk about the circulatory system of the heart, what we're talking about is the blood flow to the heart muscle itself because the heart is a muscle. And in order to pump, the heart has to receive blood and oxygen, right? And when it doesn't get enough blood and oxygen, that's when we have a problem. So the circulatory system of the heart has to do with the coronary arteries that deliver blood to the heart and that's when we start talking about atherosclerosis and things of that nature, which we will talk about again in a few minutes, okay? When we talk about the electrical system of the heart, how many people have heard the term arrhythmia? Okay, how many people resemble the term arrhythmia or have experience with arrhythmia? Okay, so arrhythmia has to do with the electrical system of the heart. So the electrical system of the heart 
there's something called the pacemaker of the heart. It's called the SA node. You don't have to remember that. Just remember the pacemaker of the heart that sends the signal. And once that signal is sent, it spreads out to the atrium. It goes down the electrical system, goes to the ventricles, and it depolarizes the heart. And something can go wrong at each one of those systems. And then finally, we have the mechanical system of the heart. And the mechanical system of the heart, that's like the valves, right? That's the ventricles. That's the ability to pump. And here's the thing. I said it's a triangle because a problem in any one of these areas can lead to problems in the other areas. So if you have an arrhythmia, that can affect the circulation to your coronary arteries and to your heart muscle itself. If you have an arrhythmia, that can also affect the mechanics of the heart. If you have a problem with the mechanics of your heart, meaning the left ventricle is weak or the pulmonary artery is too tight or the valves are either too tight, which is called stenosis or too loose, which is called insufficiency or regurgitation. Well, all those things will affect blood flow. And if you have a problem with the mechanics, guess what? That can affect the circulation and that can also affect the electricity. And if you have a problem with the electricity, well, that can affect the circulation and that can affect the mechanics. And just in case I got myself confused there. So I'm going to say it just in case I missed one. If you have a problem with the circulation of the heart, well, that's going to affect the heart's ability to pump. And it's also going to affect the electrical activity of the heart. Does that make sense? How many people just learned something new? All right. How many people knew all of this besides Peter Thompson? All right. So here's the deal. You could have a problem with the mechanics and those things could be in the neighborhood of mitral valve insufficiency, mitral regurgitation, mitral valve prolapse, aortic stenosis, right? We've heard these terms before, pulmonary artery, you know, pulmonary hypertension, uh, left ventricular uh, dysfunction or congestive heart failure, right? Which means that you have trouble pumping things. Um, so that's the mechanics. When we talk about the circulation, we're talking about things like atherosclerosis, blockages of the blood vessels. That's when we get into a conversation about things like cholesterol and risk factors and angioplasty and stent and bypass. And when we talk about the electrical system of the heart, that's when we're talking about arrhythmias. And arrhythmia is a very, very general term. It's like ice cream. And there's a lot of different flavors of arrhythmia. And depending upon which one you have, they will be more or less serious. But here's the thing. Um, what I want is I want people to be able to at least have a, a light bulb go off and say, maybe this is this, okay? In my work, I treat everything that could be the heart like it is the heart. Because if you're complaining of chest pep, pain or chest pressure or squeezing in your chest or an elephant sitting on your chest. And it happens to be that bean burrito that you ate for lunch. Well, there's no problem. Okay. We go to the emergency room. It turns out it's that bean burrito and it's a funny story. But if we assume it's that bean burrito, right? Or we assume, oh, I shouldn't have lifted that can of paint. And it actually turns out to be your heart well, then we have a, a problem. So my philosophy is always err on the side of caution and knowledge is power, okay? And, you know, Johnny Cochran told me this, okay, before he died during the OJ trial. And what he said to me was, if in doubt, check it out. If in doubt, check it out. And I think he said that, I think he made that up on the same night. He said, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. But, you know, we have that thing. And the idea is if in doubt, check it out. How many people here have been to a cardiologist in the past year? How many people, okay, hands down. How many people have not been to a cardiologist in the last year? Raise your hand. Okay, of the people who have not been to a cardiologist in the last year, raise your hand, Stick, keep it up there. How many people have not been to a cardiologist? If you've been to an internist though, put your hand down. Okay, so more the Gallagher's have not been to a cardiologist or or an internist. Peter, you haven't because I assume you have a 10 out of 10 knowledge and if there was something you would probably treat yourself. But here's the deal. You have to check these things out and depending Philip Foster, you haven't been to either one. 
Okay, so here's the deal. Uh, Dad, you can talk if you want. You can, un if, if you have a question or a comment, feel free to unmute. And Judy Fields has a, a, a question too or a comment, go ahead. Yes, my question is all of these conditions or problems that you discussed, do they show, do they show up when a patient goes for a physical and has an EKG? Is that what Judy, I think? If, Judy, if I didn't know better, I would think that you were a plant in the audience because that is the next thing we're going to talk about. Okay. Okay. So, but what is this? Well, what I wanted to say about the thing for a year is that uh, <laughs> many, many people haven't gone to see their doctor because of COVID. They have been in quarantine. So it's, the year is atypical. Absolutely. And that's, that's why what we're talking about is even more important, right? So I could have given uh, everyday run of the mill talk that we've all heard before starting in health class in junior high school. But I want to talk about what's specific about COVID year, right? Because how many people have thought about going to a doctor, but haven't gone because of COVID? That's it? Okay, so maybe you didn't hear me. If you would have normally gone to the doctor at some point this year, but you decided not to see your doctor in person because of COVID, raise your hand. All right, so how many people have not changed anything about going to their doctor? Okay, that's good. So you guys are lucky. I have. Um, there are times where I might normally go to a doctor. I don't go because I don't want to be exposed to COVID if I don't have to, okay? So um, to me, it's very serious. But Telehealth can also be important, okay? So let's go a little bit through, we talked a little bit about anatomy, we talked a little bit about physiology, we talked a little bit about pathophysiology, and just so you know, I don't usually take lectures of less than three hours, so I'm talking fast, there's a lot to get through. This is like the sampler at TGI Friday, so don't expect a full meal. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit of everything, but let's talk about what you should Noah. do. Yes. Uh, what is an internist? I'm sorry. I... An internist is a general practitioner or your family doctor or somebody who specializes in internal medicine. And the thing is that depending on the internist, okay, there are some internists who like to get their hands into everything, like to do a lot, like to order all the tests, like to wait till the tests come back abnormal and then they refer to a specialist. And then there are some internists who just kind of give out referrals to other people, okay? And then there's people who are in the middle, okay? But let's talk a little bit about risk factors, okay? Because what I talk about a lot is something called risk stratification. And when I talk about risk stratification, I'm trying to think to myself, well, who's got the greatest risk and who should be the most concerned? So when it comes to the heart and cardiovascular disease, there are things called modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. Has anyone heard this concept before? All right, so what are some examples of non-modifiable risk factors? Does anybody know? You can unmute and say it if you want. Would that be like Genetics. family history? Uh, Would it be like what? Family genetics. Family history. Family history or genetics, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you can pick your friends, you can't pick your family, right? So family history. So if you're 50 years old and your father died of a heart attack at 49, <clears throat> do you think you should be going to a cardiologist, even, even though most people at 50 are not necessarily high risk? That's a big factor. If you have a family history of three family members who've had heart attacks or who have, you know, had strokes or who have had, you know, something else going on, that's the kind of thing you want to jump on early because medicine has changed so much, okay? So it's like if you get a flat tire and you keep rolling on it or, or your brakes, like your brakes start to squeak, right? And then if you keep riding on them, well, then there goes the brake pad and then there goes the brake shoe and then there go the rotors, right? Whereas had you gone in early, well, guess what? You would have gotten away with just changing your brake pads. And a lot of times it's the same exact thing with your heart. So family history is one non-modifiable risk factor. Give me another one. A sedentary lifestyle. That is not that's unmodifiable. Modifiable. That's very modifiable. That's oh, it's okay. modifiable, right? <laughs> so non-modifiable are things that you cannot change. So we got family history. What else we got? Uh, environmental could be difficult. It could, but you can move. You can move oh, if you really have to, right? You could really uh, move. What your sex and your ancestry 
That, so ancestry, yeah. we're going to say we're going to say ancestry is still genetics and family history, biological gender, right? So the yeah. gender that you were born with, okay? Mm -hmm. So so with that, okay, we're talking about generally men are higher risk at the you know earlier on, and then eventually women. And I this is usually see if it wasn't twenty twenty one, I I'd be very, I, I'd be able to make some sexist jokes here, you know, where I make fun of men, but I but I won't. Um, but the idea is that men start off early and men have higher risk earlier on. And then eventually women catch up and surpass us, especially um, after menopause and especially if they do not replace hormones. So we have family history, gender, what else? Non heart structure. What's that? How about heart structure, basic structure of the heart? That I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on that because that can mean many different things that can be affected by many different things. Linda Yarborough. If you've already had a major heart attack, I would think that that would be non-modifiable. So you can't change the fact that you've had a heart attack, but you can change things to prevent a future heart attack, hopefully, right? But think about these two things. So you can't change your family no matter what, right? You can't change your well, you can change your biological sex, but not the sex you were born with. Okay, or the gender that you were born with. Philip, go ahead. Feel free to unmute. This is probably ridiculous, but you can't change your height. You can't change your height. You can get shorter. Autoimmune diseases? <laughs> well, if you cut your legs off, you could, I guess. Well, people get shorter as they get older, yeah, right? But and if, and if you weigh more, you could get shorter, right? Because you could have more pressure going down. So look, let me not spend the next age. time. You can't change age. your age. Beautiful. You can't change your age. So let me tell you some of them. So age, we, we got three, one, number one, uh, you know, family history, gender at birth, race, okay, is also a factor. So we know that African Americans are higher risk than whites uh, or Caucasians, okay? So those are things that essentially we can not change. So stop trying, okay? You know, it's like the serenity prayer, God give me the you know it, I forget it every time, but you know what I'm talking about. So let's talk about modifiable risk factors, okay? So if you're right now a male, African-American of, of age, and, um, you know, and you have a strong family history of heart disease, well, that's four for four in terms of risk factor, okay? So keep that in mind. And the more risk factors you have, they don't just add up, they multiply. Okay, so again, when I talk about these different things, let's forget about those non-modifiables. Let's start thinking about modifiables. And the more you change, okay, even if it's a small change in each area, the greater health you have and the further away from that ledge you get. So modifiable risk factors. Exercise. Exercise or sedentary lifestyle, right? On one side, we have exercise. On, on the other side, we have sedentary lifestyle or what people call sedentary but stressful lifestyle, right? So stress- How about healthy what? food eating? Healthy food eating. Laura, you're not gonna try to get them all, are you? You, you want could. You, you, all right, so let's give- how many, have, people, well, how many people- I have a question about ahead. women. Yes. Because I, I have read, you tell me if it's correct, that women have different signs of heart attacks than men, and they they're do. not so easily definable. Well, you know what? That's a very common line, right? That's a common thing that we hear. We hear that women have <laughs> different signs than men, and they're not that definable. Why? You know why? I'll tell you some reasons. Number one, Doctors don't ask women as many questions. Doctors don't take women as seriously. And this is a common thing. I'm not saying this to make a joke. This is very common. Women's complaints are often dismissed and we'll get to that also. Right now we're talking about risk factors. Soon we're gonna talk about signs and symptoms. Okay, Judy Fields, go for it. Mental health. Mental health. So stress, anxiety, depression. And how do those things increase our risk of heart disease. Those things increase mm -hmm. our risk of heart disease. And this is very, very important and relevant to COVID right now, right? Because this increases our fight or flight response. We have the autonomic nervous system, which we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight. We have the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. And the sympathetic nervous system was designed, this fight or flight system, so that if a caveman was walking around 
picking berries. <coughs> a saber-toothed tiger jumped on him. His body is flooded with adrenaline so that he can either fight the tiger or he can run away, okay? And that happens now if somebody bumps into us in the street, if somebody's not wearing a mask, if somebody mm. sends, you know, puts milk in our coffee and we wanted it black. Except the problem is that when we get stressed and when we get this surge of adrenaline and we don't fight it out and we don't run away to use it up, you know what the impulse is? The impulse is your heart beats faster, your heart beats stronger, right? And if you think about driving your car harder and faster on a rougher road, there's gonna be more wear and tear. Your blood vessels constrict, also increasing the workload on the heart. So mental health is very, very important as well. What else? So we got Sleep. exercise versus sedentary lifestyle, obesity. Sleep. Sleep. Sleep, very important, that's right. So if you don't get enough sleep, high risk, particularly if you have obstructive sleep apnea, we know increases your chance of coronary insufficiency, increases your chance of coronary ischemia, which means that the heart is not getting enough blood, increases your chance of arrhythmia, increases your chance of myocardial infarction, increases your chance of congestive heart failure. So if you are not sleeping well, that is something that could and should be addressed, okay? What else? Modifiable risk factors. Philip. Appointments with your doctor. Appointments with your doctor. So absolutely. So prevention is very, very important. And also making sure that you're getting the right tests, right? Making sure that you're getting the tests before you have a problem. You want a doctor that's not just going, again, not just going to pick you up after the heart attack. You want a doctor that's going to work harder on the front end of that heart attack than afterwards. Um, I'll give you other things in the interest of time. So other things are, um, so obesity, right, is a risk factor. Uh, diabetes is a risk factor. Hypertension is a risk factor. Cholesterol is a risk factor and not just high cholesterol, okay? It's not just the total number, uh, you know, your total cholesterol, but there's different types of cholesterol. So we have what's called LDL, okay, low density, you know, low density cholesterol, and we have high density cholesterol, and HDL is actually cardioprotective. And particularly in women, okay, we see a lot of people whose total cholesterol may not be low or may even be borderline high. But if you have this high amount of HDL, then you're very well protected. And likewise, you can have a relatively low, um, you know, total cholesterol. But if you have a very low L, uh, a very low HDL, then you can actually have a lower risk because you don't actually have that protection. So, in addition to just knowing your total cholesterol, it's important to know the lipid profile. So you ask for a total lipid profile. And then there are other factors, little things like A1, you know, A1C, which has to do with blood sugar over time, um, diabetes, cholesterol, um, modifiable risk factors, cigarette smoking. Smoking. Um, yeah. Yep. Big one. Okay. So you get the idea. So at this point, if this were a well, well, quick, just quickly, what's a good HDL? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to say right now. I actually, if I, I could say, I'm going to, I'm going to look it up because I don't have it memorized, but normal HDL. So normal HDL is 60. Okay. Uh, wait, what are normal HDL levels? What is a good number for HDL cholesterol? Desirable 60 or above for men, 60 or above for women, right? So I know people, I have a, a naturally low HDL for some reason, it's like 30 on a good day, okay? So for someone like that, you wanna correct your issues, okay? But again, another concept, okay, that I taught Bill Clinton campaign while he was running for president, and it's also in the book, Seven Habits of Highly Motivated People by Stephen Covey, and it is keep the main thing the main thing right? So I just gave you a whole kind of list of things that you can look at yourself and say, well, am I sedentary? Could I increase my exercise a little bit? If you increase your exercise by just 10 minutes a day, that's 70 minutes a week. That's significant, right? If you eat 12 donuts a week and you cut that to six donuts a week, that's significant, 
right? If you smoke a pack a day and you cut that to half a pack a day, that's significant. So don't let good get in the way of perfect. I mean, don't let perfect get in the way of good rather, okay? So what I mean by that is at this point, everybody, if this were confessional, you'd be coming up, you'd be saying, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And each one of you would be getting, some of you would be getting, you know, Crestor, and some of you would be getting Losartan under your tongue, and some of you would be getting Nitro, um, and some of you would be getting like these holy water shots at midnight. But the idea is think about what can you do to make your life a little better. And if you could change one, change one. If you could change two, change two. If you could change three, change three. And if you could change them all, so be it. But here's the thing. Um, when it comes to living well, okay, I, I have a book called Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness. It's not a plug right now because it's available to read for free on our website in English and Spanish, coming soon in French and Italian. But there are five things that I have come to believe make the greatest impact on health, right? Because we know if we go on any, you know, magazine, if we go on any website, there's going to be people telling us, well, if you do this, you know, and they're giving us these very obscure types of treatments. And if you eat this jellyfish stuff, it's going to help your brain. And if you eat this Qnol or this CoQ10, and it's like your mind could go crazy doing it. Okay. But again, those are little ticket items. So I'm going to tell you the five big ticket items and the reason why I'm going to tell you these things is because like if you win a shopping spree in a Walmart, don't go to the gum aisle, okay? Go to electronics. Do the things that are going to make a big difference in your life. And in my opinion, these are the five big ones. Number one is medical. Number two is exercise. Number three is nutrition. Number four is stress management and relaxation training. Number five is prevention of infection, okay? So let's start at the top. Medical. Medical is having what, Judy? Just repeat the whole list again. I'm writing it down. Judy, Medical. don't tell me what to do, Judy. All right. All right, Judy, don't tell me what to do. All right, Judy, I'm going to repeat it one more time. Here we oh. go. Medical, but I'm going to go back down through them again. I'm just, I know you are. I'm telling you the specials, then I'm going to ask you. All right. Them. Okay, here we go, Judy. All right. Number one, medical, Judy. Okay. Ju <laughs> medical is having the right doctor or doctors, taking the right medications and taking them properly, okay? How many people here have the right doctor? And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. How many people take more than five medications? Okay, has anyone ever told you how to take them, when to take them, what order to take them? I see people <laughs> nodding your heads. And the answer to that could be absolutely positively yes. And sometimes it's absolutely positively no. And it's important that you know what they are and why you're taking them, okay? I talk to people all the time and they know what they're taking. They don't know what's doing what. So it's not like M&Ms, okay? The color doesn't change the flavor, but with medicines, it's very important. So having the right doctor or doctors, healthcare team, and that can also include things like physical therapists, nurses, occupational therapists, trainers, et cetera, et cetera. But having the right team, taking the right medications, taking the medications properly, that's 20% right there, okay? In our society, we treat that like it's 90%, right? We live in a medication and procedure-based society where 90% of it is take this, take this, take this, and nobody talks about losing the weight, getting the exercise, what you should do, managing your stress and anxiety. That's considered kind of like that she, she fancy stuff that only happens in spas and clinics, but that stuff makes a difference too. Next exercise, right? When it comes to exercise, there are different types of exercise and the things that will determine how effective your exercise program is are the frequency of your exercise, the intensity of your exercise, the duration or how long you do your exercise and what type of exercise you do, okay? So how frequently should you exercise? How many people say three days a week, four days a week, five days a week, six days a week, every day. All right, of the people who say every day, keep your hands up. How many people exercise every day? 
I knew PETA was going to exercise every day. All right, Surgeon General recommendation, exercise every day, okay? Nike says just do it. I say just do something because it almost doesn't matter what you do as long as you're doing something every day. Your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. So if you ask it to sit on the couch, flip the remote, and essentially eat potato chips, that's what it gets good at doing. And if you ask it to get up and get moving again, that's what it gets good at doing again. And the other thing is that a lot of times we attribute things to, oh, I'm getting older, oh, I'm out of shape, oh, you know, I'm a, a little more short of breath, it's my age, it's this, that, the other thing. One of the number one symptoms of heart disease is denial, okay? So at least be open to the idea that this could happen to you. Okay, and I don't say that to scare you. I say that to just open your eyes so that maybe we can do something that will catch something. Um, so there's that. So we talked about exercise in terms of frequency, intensity, time and type. In terms of exercise for the heart, cardio is the best, right? So cardio is aerobic exercise, but there's something, you know, we do a lot of breathing exercises for our cardiopulmonary patients. We do balance exercises, we do flexibility exercises, and we do strengthening exercises. But this is where people get into a lot of arguments and they're like, what's better, balance or flexibility? What's better, strength or endurance? Well, the truth is you need them all, okay? But that doesn't mean that you need to do 17 different exercises in a day, because guess what? Most balance exercises can also improve your strength. Most balance exercises can also help improve your endurance. Many endurance exercises can help improve your strength and your balance and your flexibility. Many flexibility exercises can help improve your strength. You get the idea, okay? The key is to choose an exercise that you like, that you're gonna do consistently, and that is realistic, and that's gonna hit a lot of muscle groups, okay? Now, we have an online exercise program called Boot Camp. It's a 42 day program and guess how much it is? It's free, okay? So you can go on our website, pulmonarywellness.org, sign up for bootcamp and it's a 42 day program. And I guarantee you that if you do this program and you follow this for 42 days, at the end of 42 days, you will feel significantly different. And if you don't, I will give you your money back. It's that simple, okay? So wow. there's that, okay? But here's one thing that's very important. That's a joke, because I said it was free for those in the cheap seats. Um, so here's the other thing, okay? You have to check in with your doctor to make sure that you're not high risk before you do it. So you have to get your doctor's clearance, right? Because how many of us haven't exercised in 30 or 40 years, right? That's not totally unrealistic. Like if you're 75, I mean, most of us are fit in our childhood, teens, 20s, 30s, we start getting into work, 40s, we get deeper into work, 50s, we just say, screw it, it's too late, right? And, and then we have the rest of it to, to kind of, you know, work and, and, and try to work ourselves back. But there's a saying that I love that it says, if you don't make time for wellness now, you'll have no choice but to make time for disease later. And it's never too late, okay? My average patient is 80 years old with heart disease and lung disease, and I have people going up to 107, and these people can actually get better. So I'm looking around the screen, you look like every one of my patients, and there's not one person here that can't get better, I guarantee that. So there's that. Let's talk about nutrition, okay? Nutrition is a complex topic. We know when we're eating something that's completely crappy, and it doesn't also mean that you have to eat only kale, right? So if you think about what you're doing now, okay, make a move in the right direction. Make a move in the right direction. And every little step that you take in the right direction is a plus. Nutrition is a whole topic unto itself. I don't even want to get into it. But what I'm going to say is this. If you are overweight, okay, if you are significantly overweight, you are adding to a lot of your risk factors, okay? You're adding to your cholesterol, you're adding to your you know, potential for diabetes, you're adding to the stress on your heart, you're adding to the stress on your joints, you're decreasing the chances of you being more active, okay? So that's really important. But nutrition, most of us know what to do. It's not a question of knowledge, okay? It's a question of something else. 
And I'll be the first one to say, I, I do best when I have somebody to make fun of me and make sure that I am not ordering in the middle of, I live in New York City, I could order in the middle of the night, anything at any given moment, okay? But it's not usually because we don't know what to do that we don't do it. It's very complex. It's, it's a lot of psychological factors, it's motivational factors, it's access, but you can do it. You can make these changes. And again, that's why I encourage you to make a small change that you can do and write it down and keep a journal so that you can say, hey, guess what? You know what? I did three days in a row of exercise, okay? And if you could do three days in a row, you could do four days in a row. And if you could do one minute of exercise, you could do two minutes. And you could do two minutes, you could do three minutes. And boot camp, even if you can only walk two minutes now in place, boot camp will get you to 30 minutes in 42 days. And if you go from walking four minutes to 30 minutes, trust me, your life will be a lot different. Again, money back guarantee. Okay, so however much you pay up front, if it doesn't work, you'll get it back. Um, stress anxiety and depression, okay? So this is the emotional aspect of it, 20% also. Stress, anxiety, and depression, and God knows this has been a stressful, anxiety-provoking, depressing year, okay? This has been a doozy, okay? And sometimes when we feel that way, sometimes we can, you know, we work through it by pushing ourselves and it motivates some of us, and sometimes it does the total opposite, right? Helen, uh, one of one of the best stories I Helen unmute yourself because I, I just I forgot I love the story when you were talking about how many episodes of Breaking Bad you 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 watched in a row I think it was like 76 episodes of Breaking Bad I mean we all have these Netflix shows that we sit and we're like I'm gonna watch some TV I'll see you in 10 days right and it's like it's like I'll see you in 10 days because I have to finish you know, this. Um, so, you know, our emotions have a huge impact on our physical well being, and our physical well being can have a huge impact on our emotions. So, think about, you know, even shortness of breath. We get short of breath, it makes us anxious. We get anxious, we become more short of breath, right? So, there's that. And then finally, and this is so important this year more than ever prevention of infection, okay? For my crew, my cardiopulmonary community, we were ready for this, okay? I don't know too many people in my community that got COVID, thankfully, but that's because we've been practicing for this for decades. And that means frequent hand washing, flu shots, pneumonia vaccine, uh, avoiding sick people, avoiding crowds. This year it's become more obvious than ever, but these things work. And it's much easier to prevent yourself from getting sick than to take care of yourself once you're sick anyway. All right, signs and symptoms. Question. I'm a psychotherapist and I work with a lot of psychiatrists and internists and we're as a team. And we, we've discussed, we often discuss that when somebody has an illness and if it's a more serious illness, not always serious, if we look at what was going on emotionally for them, stress, psych psychology, how often that's such a major factor in triggering the beginning of the illness. Could be, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, again, you know, we, if you think about, you know, what's going on now, most of us aren't socializing. We're spending a lot of time alone. Right. right? We're missing the, um, you know, the things that cause us, you know, or provide us with excitement and pleasure. So how can we make that up? TV, food, um, you know, sometimes it just feels good to come and, you know, have that, whatever it is that you want to eat. Phil, question, comment. Could you elaborate a little bit on shortness of breath causes and remedies? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, we're, we're coming almost to the end of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a lot of questions, so don't worry, I'm not running off. But let's talk about warning signals, okay, and what should make you go to your doctor. So when we talk about cardiopulmonary signs and symptoms, Chest pain is an obvious one, okay? Uh, anything in your chest is something that should at least be checked out. And there are many factors that can cause chest pain. It could be cardiac in nature. It could be respiratory in nature. It could be gastrointestinal in nature. It could be reflux, okay? But again, if we assume it's the heart and we get it checked out and it turns out to be reflux, no harm, no foul. 
if we assume it's reflux and we treat it with Maalox for six months and then we have a heart attack, now we have a problem, right? Lynn, did you have a question? Yes. Go for it. Nice um, to see you, yeah, Indigestion, like yep. um, I've yep. been experiencing more indigestion. Yep. So here's the thing. So between our neck and our belt, okay, we got a lot of systems shoved into a very small area. So we have the respiratory system. We have the gastrointestinal system. We have the cardiovascular system. And very often the symptoms of one can seem like the symptoms of the other. And the question that was asked before about women, okay, women also experience things differently. However, okay, there are things that people should get checked out. Um, you know, like you wanna know if your, your brakes work, right? Before you get in your car, like that's a good thing to know. You want to know when you're on a, on, a, on a plane if the landing gear works, right? You want to make sure that the wings are screwed on. So there are certain things that, in my opinion, are just worth checking. And, you know, I, I have a, a little bit of stress in my life. And I go to my doctor and, she let, and I ask her the same question every year. I say, do you think this is the year I'm going to have the first heart attack? And she laughs. And I said, but it's not impossible. I do have some risk factors but I get things checked out because I wanna sleep at night. And it's the same thing for my patients. I want to sleep at night knowing that you're gonna be safe. I don't want you to come to rehab or to therapy or to walk up the subway stairs and I'm gonna be like rolling the dice. Are you gonna be okay? No, and there's ways to check these things out. So gastrointestinal, reflux, upset stomach. Um, Lynn, just give me a minute because I'm gonna take questions in a few minutes, okay? Um, but a lot of these things are what we call nonspecific symptoms, okay? And when we talk about nonspecific symptoms, I'm not saying you don't know what they are. And I'm not saying we can't describe them, but shortness of breath can come from the heart or it could come from the lungs or it can come from anxiety or it could come from the gastrointestinal system or it could come from a lot of different things. Chest pain can come from the heart. It can come from the lungs. It could come from anxiety. It could come from something else. So the idea is, as Johnny Cochran says, when in doubt, check it out. And sometimes if you're of a certain age, if you have enough risk factors, then check it out, even if you're not having symptoms, okay? So let's talk about what tests should you be having, okay? How many people have had an EKG? Okay, so you remember at the beginning when I was talking about the three systems of the heart, I was talking about electrical and mechanical and circulatory. So an EKG is a very, very direct measure of the electrical system of the heart. And it's a very indirect measure of the circulatory system of the heart and an even less direct measure of the mechanical system of the heart. But here's the thing, at rest, right? So most people get a what's called a resting EKG, which is you go in your doctor's office, you lie on the table, they do the test, and a resting EKG is like a photograph, right? So you could be, I could say to my kid, smile, and he smiles, and then I turn around and he goes like this, right? The heart could do the same thing, right? Like we all hear these crazy stories. You say, I went to the doctor, the doctor said everything is okay, walked out, and, and dropped dead or had a heart attack, right? Or next thing you know, and we hear these stories, right? Because an EKG is a measure of the electrical activity at rest, sitting there in that chair or lying on that table at that six second period in time. And that's not usually where people get into a jam when it comes to their heart, because when it comes to heart, that's a factor of supply and demand, okay? So sitting here doing nothing there's very low demand. So if you're actually having an, a problem right then and there while you're sitting and doing nothing, then you should go to the emergency room because that means you can't even sit and do nothing and meet the demand of that, okay? So that's where something like a stress test comes in or that's where something like a halter monitor comes in. So I'm just gonna stick with the electrical activity for a second. EKG, electrical activity, photograph in time. But who needs an EKG? Everybody, okay? But it don't count on that as your safety net. So just because your EKG is normal doesn't mean, doesn't mean you don't have a problem, okay? And if arrhythmia is the problem, so in other words, if you have a problem with palpitations or skipped beats or things of that nature, then you're, you, you're not necessarily gonna catch it when you're sitting in the doctor's office. So that's where things 
like a halter monitor come in. And a halter monitor is basically a 24 hour or more 12 lead EKG where you keep notes. You say, well, I got this chest pain or I had this racing heart. And you write down what you were doing at the time. You say, oh, well, you were walking up the stairs. That explains why. Oh, you were sleeping. Well, why, why did that happen at that time? So that's another test you could get. The other thing is there's something called a stress test. So a stress test under most circumstances are walking on the treadmill with a 12 lead EKG on. And that's gonna talk about your ability to exercise. It's gonna talk about electrical activity. It's gonna talk indirectly about mechanical activity and circulatory activity. But if you also get an echo at the same time, so in other words, an echo is an ultrasound. That's where they put the ultrasound on your chest. And that's the thing that goes like, wow, 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 wow. Right, we've all seen that before. So the idea is before the test, you get a resting EKG, you get a resting echocardiogram, you do your exercise, you get the stress, increase the demand, see if your heart is able to meet the demand, and then you get it after. Stress echo is my favorite test, okay? Why? Because you get electrical activity, you get circulatory activity, you get mechanical activity, and it's non-invasive, okay? a stress echo is a beautiful thing because you learn about all three systems of the heart. And if something shows up, then we know what the next move is. And the thing is, if you do have coronary disease or you do have risk factors, so high cholesterol, high blood pressure, I don't think we said blood pressure before, huge one, right? Because if you have high blood pressure, that means the heart is always carrying an extra load, okay? Now, there's a lot of people who, how many people have this idea? I don't like taking medications. Raise your hand. Okay. I don't like taking medications either, but you know what I like it better than? Having a heart attack. You know what I like it better than? Having a stroke. You know what I like it better than? Going into uh, an arrhythmia that's gonna kill me, okay? So yes, I agree with that. It's like people say, I don't trust the vaccine. <sighs> right, but put it in a vape. People are gonna take it in a second, right? <laughs> But the idea is everything is about risk and benefit. Everything is about risk and benefit. So the idea is if it's riskier to not take the medication than to take the medication. You know, I have a doctor, he's a brilliant doctor and you could watch this webinar also on our website. It's called, You Gotta Have Heart with Howard Weintraub. He's one of the top three, equally tied for one of the top three people I know. This is what he says. He says, listen, you tell me what you're willing to do Meaning, are you willing to exercise? Are you willing to lose the weight? Are you willing to lower your blood pressure? Are you willing to lower your cholesterol? And tell me what you're willing to do, and then I'll do the heavy lifting, okay? And I think that's a great way of thinking about it because you know what? Nobody wants to take medication that they don't have to take. But if you're not gonna lose the weight, so is taking medication better than being 50 pounds overweight? Yeah. Is taking the medication better than having a blood sugar of 400? Yes. Is it better than, you know, so you have to put everything in perspective and ask yourself, well, which is going to be worse for me? Okay. So there's that. Okay. And then finally, the last test that people would get was if they're really symptomatic, okay, then they would get something called an angiogram, which is actually a cardiac catheterization where they're actually looking at the coronary arteries and they can go in and do an intervention while they're there. And that's where things like an angioplasty and or a stent come in. Okay. So here's some signs and symptoms you should look out for that should always be something you discuss with you. Shortness of breath, chest pain or pressure. Um, now you mentioned before that women are different. Okay, women are different, diabetics are different, mm -hmm. people with neuropathy are different, okay? So when we think about the chest pain associated with coronary disease, we typically think about left-sided substernal chest pain with radiation down the left arm, right? If you're having that, it's probably your heart, okay? There's a pretty good chance it's your heart. But you can also have something that's not like that. You can have something that goes up into your neck and it might just feel a little funny. It might feel a little tight. It might feel a little tingly. You might feel something in your jaw, okay? So if you have an argument with your husband or your wife and next thing you know, your jaw feels like it's clenching up or something like that, then you have to at least consider the idea that this could be what we call an anginal equivalent or a non-traditional or a non-typical um, sign of coronary ischemia or angina, okay? Women also get things in their back, 
okay, around their shoulder blade area. And again, think about supply and demand. So if every time you walk up the stairs, you get squeezing in your chest with radiation down the left arm, well, that's a no brainer. But something that people may not think about is, well, you know what, when I walk up the steps, I get this kind of tightness in my neck or my jaw or my back. And I got news for you. A lot of doctors don't think of that, okay? Um, I have a patient right now, 86 years old. Um, she's a, a stand-up comedian. Her book came out this week. Okay, went to her doctor for two years. She's a golfer. She's very active. She travels a lot. She has a burlesque show in, in Paris and went to her doctor for two years and said, I'm more short of breath. I'm more short of breath. I'm more short of breath. So what do you think is going to happen if a patient is 86, if an 86-year-old woman with lung disease goes to a doctor and says more short of breath, more short of breath, more short. You think they're gonna send out the search party to figure out what's going on? No, they're gonna, well, you're getting older. Well, you put on some weight. Well, you know, you've, you, you, you've, um, you know, you become less active, et cetera, et cetera. She had a massive heart attack, okay? And she lost 50% of her heart muscle. And now we're working to, to, to work that back. But the idea is, had it been taken seriously, and I'm talking to all of you, if you take these things seriously, again, I would much rather, I work EMS for 20, I would much rather take somebody to the hospital <clears throat> 19 days in a row and have nothing be wrong than not take them that one day and they have a heart attack at home, right? Again, it's, it's, it's you always have to err on the side of caution. So there's that. Um, and so when you get these things, um, and you get these signs and symptoms and you say to your doctor, hey, you know what? I was watching this lecture and you know what? I, feel, I think I would feel more comfortable if you would give me a stress test or if you would do an echocardiogram on me. And the other thing is if nothing else, you get a baseline because things are only as good as where they are in relation over time. So in other words, if somebody says to me, my blood pressure is 180 over hundred, sounds terrible, right? But what you might not know is that if 15 minutes ago it was 220 over 120, well, 180 over 100 means we're moving in the right direction. So I encourage everybody to at least get some baseline testing. Start with the EKG. Start with a resting echocardiogram. If your symptoms come on with activity or stress, ask your doctor to do a stress test. So I'm going to just run down this list quickly, and then I'll take other questions. Do all of these conditions or problems show up when patients have their physicals and doctor does an EKG? So the answer is absolutely not. Okay. So again, um, and that's Judy. She just left. So nobody tell her she's going to miss out on that. No, I'm kidding. You could tell her. Um, but the idea is that, you know, again, an EKG is going to show you what's happening at that moment electrically in the time that the tech presses no, that button and that strip moves out. Okay. Does that include COVID-19 telemed visits for cardio and primary? So a telemedicine visit is a good start, okay? Certainly a doctor can take a good history. They could go over symptoms. They could go over, um, you know, they could go over medications with you. They could give you suggestions. But at a certain point, you need some real actual diagnostic tests, which is why, you know, we were doing a lot of telehealth for our rehab patients. And in October, we just decided that we have to get our hands on people. So you know what? It's a good visit. It's a good start. But eventually, nothing takes the place of a good physical exam and some diagnostic testing. Um, pulmonarywellness.org, do you have any recommendations for myocarditis and scarring on the bottom of my heart? I started metoprolol on an aspirin after discovering this in a cardiac MRI. So myocarditis is inflammation of the, of the heart muscle itself and scarring on the bot. So scarring on the bottom of the heart could mean multiple different things because when somebody has a heart attack, they develop a scar there, okay? Or some people, and if this is a COVID question, some people um, will actually develop scarring on the inside of their heart. But this is something that again, should be talked about with your cardiologist, okay? And there are anti-inflammatories and there are things that can be done, uh, but I can't recommend them tonight. Do I have any recommendations for people with POTS? A lot of them, they're on our website. Again, that's another two hour talk. Um, less than 20 minutes left, yep. And that went 40 minutes ago. Can you explain how myocarditis works, how COVID causes myocarditis? So myocarditis, myo means muscle, cardio means heart, and itis means inflammation. So it's essentially inflammation 
of the heart muscle. And we know that COVID is super inflammatory based and it can inflame any part of your system. Um, somebody, Aaron also posted um, ways to make an appointment or schedule a consult in the chat. So it's hdphysicaltherapy.com. Um, what are the exercises that hit all a lot of different exercises? And again, boot camp hits everything and anything. So pulmonarywellness.org, sign up for boot camp. Can you explain, explain the nutri, not nutritional difference between sugars and added sugars? So sugars are basically simple carbohydrates and they come in a lot of different foods. Everything gets broken down. Fruit has a lot of sugar, but it's not the same processed refined sugar like what comes in a box. Generally, you know, inherent sugars are, are better than processed sugars, but sugar as a whole is not your best friend. Um, mm. suggest, suggestions related to exercise for those with limited mobility. Great question. So if you have trouble walking, standing, use of arms. So boot camp has a lot of that stuff. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes is by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he says, if you can't run if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. And I say, if you can't crawl, then breathe, okay? Start with breathing exercises. Start with gentle, you know, arm and leg exercises. Start standing, holding. You know, if you can only stand for 15 seconds, stand for 20 seconds. Hold on to something, okay? There's a million different ways to modify every single thing. And again, um, you know, there's ways to modify it and you have to start somewhere, okay? So wherever you are right now, that's our starting point, okay? A lot of times doctors send me their patients, they say, you know what, we've tried everything. And what a lot of people consider the end of the line, my team considers the starting line. And, you know, it's just a matter of assessing people, figuring out what are the big problems going, you know, what are the problems going from big to little, address the big ones first, okay? and little by little by little start digging out of that hole. You know, we didn't get here overnight. We're not getting out of here overnight. Um, but there's another beautiful saying that I love, which is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time is today. So wherever you are at this moment, tonight, spend your time thinking, okay? Spend your time planning, getting yourself in the mood. And then tomorrow, change one damn thing in your life, okay? Whether it be you walk an extra 50 feet, you eat one less donut, you smoke one, one less cigarette, you do one less injection of heroin. Uh, sorry, that I didn't mean that. I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't think anyone here is doing heroin. I hope you're not. But if you are, do a little less tomorrow. Um, and now I will take questions from the audience. So please feel free to unmute and ask your question. Lynn, go for it. You're not oh, yeah. afraid so is your new location on First Avenue, is that the new pulmonary wellness center? So we're on Second Avenue. So we're at 815 Second Avenue, which is another physical therapy practice called H&D Physical Therapy. It is not yet the pulmonary wellness and rehabilitation center. Unfortunately, after 22 years, the pulmonary wellness and rehabilitation center went up in smoke and, you know, and, and it's, it sounds like a terrible thing and it seems like it would have been a hard decision, but it was an easy decision because like I said, my patients are average 80 years old and you know, heart disease, lung disease. I don't want people coming out in New York City. So um, you know, it, we had no choice but to do it. So what we're doing in the new facility is we're doing mostly uh, COVID research and post COVID long hauler research, but we will at some point have room for our old cardiopulmonary patients and some new cardiopulmonary patients. So it's definitely worth reaching out to us and um, you know, at least getting the ball rolling. Um, we're also in the process of trying to figure out how do we social distance? How do we you know, make sure that people are safe coming to and from the center? Uh, we're gonna want everybody to be vaccinated before coming for cardiopulmonary rehab. But the vaccination is a game changer, okay? So that's, that's big. So you know, I, it's not at this moment, and I also wouldn't necessarily recommend that you run out this moment and come for cardio, cardiopulmonary rehab. For now, that's what boot camp is for, but at least get in the system so that when we're ready to pull it together, we at least have you on our radar list. Other questions, Fred? Uh, yes, uh, I have relatively low resting pulse, but I've noticed it's higher in the morning than when I go to bed, and that seems counterintuitive. Is that a, something to be mm -hmm. concerned about? 
So the answer is a definite maybe, okay? Um, so generally in the more, no, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That, that, <laughs> means like, that means like there's, I'm not saying you should be concerned. I'm saying there's a million different factors to what you said, right? So if I could tell you the answer to that, but I would ask you questions. So when come, someone comes to me, I, people, and Facebook's funny, right? Like I, I, I laugh at Facebook and I cry at Facebook, okay? Because Facebook is like, it, it, I swear people, it's like if somebody asked me how to fix a car, I don't know anything about how to fix a car, but that won't stop me from telling them how to change their spark plugs. Same thing with medicine. Fred, these are the questions I would ask you. Number one, what is your heart rate? And these, and when I ask questions like this, these are questions you can ask yourself, right? So when I teach, I don't try to teach one person something. I teach you all how to think about things, not how to memorize things. But what's your heart rate in the morning, Fred? Uh, 65. What's your heart rate in the evening? 55. You have nothing to worry about. Oh, maybe, maybe. But let me go, <laughs> let me go a step further, okay? Um, so normal heart rate is 60 to 100, okay, at rest, okay? Less than 60 is called bradycardia. More than 100 is called tachycardia. But there are many different reasons why somebody could have a higher than normal pulse and reasons why they could have a, a, a lower than normal pulse. So in your situation, okay, um, both are on the low end. So these are the questions I would actually... Let me put someone else on the spot. Greg Hallstrom, unmute. Un this is my protege and also my boss at the same time. Oh. Greg, unmute. You just finished a cardiopulmonary course. Greg, what do you want to know? He just knocked himself. What do you want to know about this gentleman, Greg? What medications are you taking, Fred? What medications are you taking? Great question. Uh, basically, uh, blood pressure. Which one? Uh, uh, so and Lodipin and Losartan. And Losartan. Okay. Lo so you have an ARB and, and you have um, an, an A. So what else? Do you take anything that could lower your heart rate? Any beta blockers? So that would be the first thing we think, right? I've been very, very active all my life. Uh, so that's the next question, next right? Question. So you're an athlete. So an the athlete. Mountain climbers. Yeah. Okay. So, so. An athlete is generally going to have a lower heart rate than somebody who's more oh. sedentary. Why? Because an athlete's heart will increase in size, but not in a pathologic way. So an athlete will pump more blood with each stroke. And as a result, they don't have to beat his heart. So it's like if you're carrying a big bucket like this versus a little cup like this with the big bucket, you can make less trips. 65 to 55, I wouldn't be concerned about that at all. Other things I would ask you are, you don't seem like the anxious type. In fact, you seem like you make <laughs> others anxious, Fred. Um, but, um, but, um, but let me ask you this, do you drink coffee? Uh, at one place, only cappuccino. <laughs> Okay. Very, very, very little. I'm, it's not a, you know, must have kind of a thing. Okay. So I'm going to tell you this on its face. It doesn't worry me at all. Okay. Because oh. you're athletic. You're, you know, I don't know about your other risk factors, but I would ask your doctor that. And I would say, you know what, this is what I noticed. Okay. My heart rate is 50, you know, 65 in the morning, 55 at night. And the only thing I would want to know is I would want to make sure that there are not, there's not a, a pathologic reason why you have a low heart rate. So that there's not something wrong with your sinus node, which is the pacemaker, that there's not something uh, that is wrong with your conduction system. And then the other thing is, I would ask you about signs and symptoms, right? So if you tell me, you know what, when my heart rate is 55, whoa, I feel dizzy, okay? Yeah. Well, that's a problem, okay? Or if you tell me when my heart rate is 55, I feel exhausted. Or when, I, I, when my heart rate is 55, I have this. Other than that, on its face, I don't think it's anything to worry about. But, you know, again, um, ask your doctor. Again, I would have a stress test. And what you probably find out is that you're probably in good shape. But again, we don't want to assume. OK, we don't want to we don't want to assume it's something good and then it's not something good. Philip Foster, question. A question. Um, my blood pressure drops like 20 or some or more points sometimes when I'm exercising. Do you have any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that. So, so here's the thing. So again, in every single thing that anybody's going to ask me now, I could tell you 10 different scenarios of what could be going on. Okay. Let me give you a couple. Okay. So first of all, do you take any medications? Yes. What do you take? 
Uh, I can't remember all the names, but there, I have kidney disease and heart disease. Okay. So you have kidney disease and heart disease. So what I would say is this, okay? Again, I would want to stress echo and I'll tell you why, okay? Let's say you're the anxious type or let's say you have hypertension. Remember what I told you before about the fight or flight response? So I told you that if a caveman is walking and picking berries, this adrenaline comes out of his system and then that adrenaline is used up either fighting or running away through physical activity, right? So let's say you're the nervous type, the anxious type, or you just have hypertension, right? So it's very possible that you're in a hyper inflammatory state or that you have a high degree of sympathetic nervous system activity. And when you're actually exercising, you're using up some of that adrenaline and you're actually settling in. And when you exercise, your blood vessels also dilate under normal circumstances. And it's possible that that's decreasing the pressure because blood pressure is a function of what's called cardiac output times peripheral resistance. So cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. So your heart rate should go up with exercise. Your stroke volume- Yes, the, pulse, the, pulse, the pulse does go up. Right, so your heart rate should go up. Your stroke volume, which is how much blood you pump with each stroke should go up. So that should mean your pressure should go up unless your blood vessels are dilating so much that they're offsetting that. But here's some potential reason, things that I'd be concerned about. So is it possible that you are exercising and your heart is not able to meet the demand of that exercise? So in other words, you know, if you have, have you ever been, have you ever had a heart attack? Uh, no. Have you ever been told you have congestive heart failure? I have two stents. So you have, okay, so you have heart 20 disease. years ago, yes. Okay. So you have two stents 20 years ago, okay? So a lot could happen in 20 years, right? Do you have them checked to make sure that they're still open? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in my personal opinion, I would want you to have a stress echo, right? Because what I'm, what I'm a little bit, what I would think, and the thing that I would, and I'm not saying this is what I think it is. I'm not saying this is what it probably is. I'm just saying the thing I'd want to make sure of is, is your blood pressure dropping? Because when you exercise, your heart is not getting enough blood flow and the left ventricle is not able to meet the demand of that exercise. So if you haven't had a stress test in the last year, then I would ask your doctor for that. Okay, thank you. Sure, other questions? Lynn. I have a question. Um, is heart rate mean beats per minute? Beats per minute, heart rate, beats per minute, pulse, all the same thing. I, I have a, when I use my oximeter, sometimes my heart rate goes down to 44. Okay, so that's, so, that's a, uh, so that's a situation there. Okay, so the question is, this is what I would wonder about that. Number one, are you taking any medications? Yes. You take any beta blockers? No. Okay, what do you take? Clonopin. Okay, clonopin can lower your heart rate. What else? That's it. That's it, okay. So 44, so the, the, the SA node um, is designed to pump at 60 to 100 beats per minute, okay? When you're in the 40s, that means that in all likelihood, now you could have something called sinus bradycardia, which means that it is the same pacemaker of the heart that is kicking in, okay? However, you just have a lot of parasympathetic tone. So meaning parasympathetic is the opposite of fight or flight, meaning that if you were athletic, if you were very athletic for most of your life, that could be something. But again, I would wanna know symptoms. So when you drop to 44, What's your blood pressure? When you drop to 44, do you get dizzy or lightheaded? When you drop to 44, and I would also want to know why are you dropping to 44? Because under normal circumstances, the pacemaker of the heart shouldn't allow you to get that low. So in my opinion, I would ask, the first thing I would ask my doctor for is a halter monitor, okay? 24 hours to 72 hours to see, is it really dropping down? Because we also know that sometimes pulse oximeters can give us an erroneous reading, right? Especially if you have any type of arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation. That's what my doctor, I asked this doctor this question and he, cause I had PACs and he said that might contribute to a lower reading than is Okay, that so it might, okay. But I don't wanna be like, it might, it might be an alligator or it might be a furry bunny, right? So I don't wanna, you know, I, I, I'd say I want to know for sure. And it's an easy test. 
So the test is 72 hours halter monitor. Okay. Yep. When you look at your oximeter and it says 44, write it down and say, I saw 44 on the oximeter. And then they're going to have a timestamp where they could say, well, guess what? You did have some PACs there. Okay. Or they could say, hey, guess what? You had a six second pause because your SA node is sick. Or, mm -hmm. or the SA node gets its blood supply from the right coronary artery. And remember that triangle that I told you about before, where I said electrical and mechanical and circulatory are all connected. So I've seen cases where somebody has a blockage of the right coronary artery, and then that affects the function of the SA node. So these are things that are easily determinable, but I wouldn't leave it up to, well, you'll probably be okay. I okay. want to know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Go for it. What does a CT heart of the coronaries with IV contrast, what type of, what does that show you in a test? So what you're talking about is a CT angiogram, okay? So a CT angiogram, so CT is computerized tomography. It's like a CAT scan, right? Uh -huh. And the thing is, what that is, is you get contrast and it's actually going to outline the coronary arteries themselves. And depending on what it say, sees, it's going to be able to show if there's any occlusion or blockages in the arteries. And it's a good test for the simple reason that if the alternative to that is, is that what the angiogram is an angiogram, right? right? And so, that's invasive. And that's invasive. And there are potential, you know, when you snake something up your groin right. in your heart, there's potential for problems there. So a CT angio and, you know, Tina, at your age, you know, you're not a high likelihood of having coronary disease. Um, right. so I know your situation. I'm not going to, you know, go into detail, but you know what? It's a non, I'm actually scheduled for one myself because I don't want an angio. I want to know, I want to know, do I have blockages in my heart? So CT right. angio is going to tell you percentages of blockages. Okay. And incidentally, okay. <clears throat> the majority of us do have some atherosclerosis, okay? And most people don't get symptomatic until they reach about a 70% blockage. So CT angio is they give you this dye, the CAT scan will look at it and it will show you a very similar picture to if you had a cardiac catheterization, except it's non-invasive. Perfect, because he asked, he told me that, that he wanted to do an angiogram and I said, can I do something that's non-invasive? Yep. like a cardiac MRI or yep. Yep. That 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 if, you, if you are a high risk, right? If you are, mm -hmm. you know, 75 years old and overweight and you had a family history of heart disease and you were a cigarette smoker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a high likelihood that you're actually going to have coronary disease and you're going to yep. have a blockage. Or if you do have symptoms like chest pain or shortness of breath on activity, then an angio could make much more sense because guess what? While they're in there, they can open mm -hmm. it up and they could put a stent in and there's your right. intervention and you come out better than you were before. So right. the test you're gonna get, if it does show something, at some point you're gonna need an angio anyway. If, right. I'm, if I'm a betting man, I bet it's gonna show nothing. I bet it's gonna show clean coronary arteries. Right, and that's why I didn't want to be invasive if I didn't have to. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, perfect. Come on. Absolutely. Other questions, comments? Um, so you said this will be available online? Uh, I, yes, I don't know where, but I will get a link and post it on our website at least, but I'm sure it's going to be on the H. Aaron, where will it be available, or Greg? On the H&D website? It will be eventually, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions, comments? Five-minute warning, five-minute warning. Last chance. Kind of curious. The difference between a nuclear stress test. Oh, um, Great question. So, um, you know, there are, are nuclear and pharmacologic stress tests, right? So for the patient who really can't walk on a treadmill very well, you have a broken leg, but you need uh, surgery. You have COPD. And before you actually got up to what we need to know about your heart, you get short of breath or your legs become fatigued, right? So a lot of times <clears throat> I get stress test reports from people and I see a lot of pulmonary patients and the test says something like, well, you know, um, patient walked for two minutes and 16 seconds and they stopped because of shortness of breath and the heart rate was this and the blood pressure was this. 
but negative for ischemia, right? Meaning negative, there's no blockages, meaning the heart muscle is not, it is getting adequate blood flow. But the problem is that if we stop the test because you're short of breath, because of your COPD, we could totally miss coronary disease, right? So what a nuclear test does or a pharmacologic test does is they give you uh, a medication that simulates exercise that either mm. speeds up the heart or increases its contractility or dilates the coronary arteries. And then they're able to look at it under a scan. Uh, and some of them will actually show uh, what's called hot spot imaging, which means that, um, you know, so, so imagine like there's a, an outline of the heart and certain isotopes are taken up by the heart muscle during exercise. And in some of these tests, if it fills in, that's great. And in some of them, if it doesn't fill in, but it lights up, that's not good. So if it fills in, that means the heart circulation is good and it's able to take uptake all of the material. Um, and that's a, a good test. That's a good test. Other in, other, in some of them, the negative, the negative part. So a scar tissue will light up or an area of ischemia will light up. So it's just a test that will allow you to get the information without you actually having to walk on the treadmill. And personally, I think it's an underused test because especially with pulmonary patients or somebody who's got you know very, very sedentary or somebody who's very, very overweight or has got a lot of orthopedic issues and you can't really walk on the test, you, know, you re can't really walk on a treadmill and not to mention that the treadmill test that most people, you know, use in stress test vigorous for, you know, for the average person, you know, aside from the average young, healthy person. So we miss a lot of information. And a lot of people, you know, if you think about shortness of breath, if you have lung disease and you get short of breath when you walk, right? Like people say, what, you know, oh, I get short of breath. In New York City, like what I hear most is walking up subway stairs, walking uphill, running for the bus. That's the New York City pulmonary triathlon. Um, but the idea is that if you stop because you're short of breath, then you may never ever get up to the point where your heart is challenged enough, right? But then what happens sometimes is we get people into better condition with pulmonary rehab, and now all of a sudden we discover heart disease because now they actually are able to walk up a flight of stairs or do the thing where the demand is too great for their heart disease because it doesn't take a lot to sit on the couch and eat potato chips. Twelve minutes left, if you want them. Uh, symptoms of pulmonary artery hypertension. Great question. So pulmonary hypertension is different than hypertension, right? So remember, before I talked about the left heart and the right heart. So when we talk about systemic hypertension, we're talking about the that's basically high blood pressure that we talk about. So that's high blood high blood pressure in the periphery, and that's going to increase the workload on the left side of the heart. And just to give you a little lesson in plumbing, okay? So the left ventricle, okay, pumps harder against this increased pressure. As a result, being a muscle, the left ventricle can hypertrophy or thicken and grow in size. Above the left ventricle is the mitral valve, and if the left ventricle thickens and grows in size, it can cause the mitral valve to become insufficient. And then when the left ventricle contracts, blood actually goes forward into the aorta and backwards into the left atrium called mitral regurgitation. Then the left atrium can get bigger, then it can go into the lungs, and that's what we call congestive heart failure. So it's like the knee bone is connected to the hip bone, well, the left ventricle, Oh, Terry, I see what's going on there. <laughs> Terry, I see that cat. I know what's coming next. Um, but now pulmonary hypertension is something different. So pulmonary hypertension affects the right side of the heart because pulmonary hypertension is increased pressure in the pulmonary circulation. And that could be the pulmonary artery, which comes off the left ventricle. So, I mean, I'm sorry, the right ventricle. So in between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery is the pulmonic valve. And that's the right side of the heart is usually the, the low pressure side of the heart. Because remember what I told you before, it only has to pump a few inches. So when the pressure in the pulmonary mm -hmm. artery increases, well, now it's like you have, you know, a Volkswagen bug on the autobahns, right? Like it's not built for that. So it does damage to the right side of the heart. And symptoms would be shortness of breath. Um, it could be pallor, meaning blueness in the face uh, or blueness in the extremities. Uh, I'm sorry, pallor is pale, right? Meaning white, pale, because you're not 
um, perfusing well. It could be blueness because of hypoxia. It could be a, a drop in oxygen saturation. Um, it could be decreased activity tolerance. So, you know, if you're used to walking three blocks a day and you walk three blocks and you walk three blocks and you walk three blocks, and then all of a sudden you become symptomatic at two and a half blocks, well, you have to say, well, why am I becoming symptomatic? And sometimes it's a benign reason. You haven't been walking as much, it's cold outside, it's COVID, but sometimes that could be the first clue that something's going on. And we do a bunch of webinars on pulmonary hypertension on our website, pulmonarywellness.org. Other questions, nine minutes to go, if you want them. Betty Ritchie, I know you wanna say something, go. Thank you. Um, Yesterday was one year since I went into the hospital with COVID, oh, and I, uh, I have, I know that you're not sure that I necessarily have long COVID, but um, the last couple of months, I've had neuropathy in my arm that I've never had before, the right arm, and I don't know whether it's, there's a little numbness, there's a little tingling. Um, All right. So, kind of tightness. So here's the deal. So you're right. We don't know if you have long COVID, okay? The way that you've responded to exercise over time, I don't know. I don't think you have long COVID. I think you had COVID, okay? And not everybody who gets COVID becomes a long hauler. And the people who wind up in the hospital, on a vent, in the ICU, those people don't usually become long haulers. Those people just have a prolonged recovery. And my gut feeling is that's where you are now. Neuropathy, okay, neuropathy is common in COVID, but what you described to me doesn't sound like COVID neuropathy. And there's a million things probably of which any other therapist besides me at h and Physical Therapy could probably name better than me. But I would think about things, you know, something, it sounds like it could be musculoskeletal. It sounds like it could be something local in your neck. It could be something in your shoulder, um, but it's worth checking out, you know, um, you know, it's like, just because COVID is prevalent, COVID's huge. And of course we have to consider COVID, but you know, as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And um, you know, it's like um, not everything is long COVID. And that to me doesn't sound like long COVID. It sounds like it could be something musculoskeletal. It sounds like it could be something related to your neck or your shoulder or your back. Um, but whatever it is, it's easy to find the answer to that. You know, it's easy to find the answer to that. So orthopedist, you know, physical therapist can evaluate you, can't, you know, can do an evaluation, but, you know, get some imaging. That to me doesn't sound like long COVID. Like nobody winds up with long COVID in one shoulder after a year. Yay. I think I have it in my feet, um, but uh, it's just the number. So again, could be circulation, could be orthopedic and musculoskeletal could be something else. We don't know, but you know, I'll tell you this, 95% of what I know about medicine, I learned from watching House MD, right? You wanna learn about medicine, watch House. Watch every episode of House, you'll know everything you need to know. But you know, there's an art to differential diagnosis, right? And what, hardly anybody does it, but what differential diagnosis is, is Betty, you tell us you have this thing in your shoulder and we think of every possible thing it could be. And you remember on house, they write all the things that it could be, right? And then little by little, there's tests for each one. And you obviously work up the most dangerous to least dangerous. And as you cross things off, it becomes obvious what it is. So there's no way I could tell you what it is. Right. But I could tell you that somebody who works you up thoroughly can and will. Five minutes to go. Let's go. Go. Can I ask a question? I. Yep. That was a question. Do you want another one now? Yes, please. All right. I, All right. I had to step away for a few minutes, so I don't know. What, um, I um, have, I, I don't know, something happened to my screen. My name is Ann Gruber. Okay. Um, I, I know something happened to my screen. I don't want to fiddle with it while we only okay. have a few minutes. I have, um, I get migraines and I take Imitrex a lot. And a couple of doctors over the years have said that it's a vascular constrictor. You better stop because of your heart. I don't have any heart disease that I know of. It's not really in my family. And I've gone to a cardiologist to telemed during COVID and explained everything that I wanted to get checked out. And they just kind of shrugged their shoulders. 
Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, like, is this something I should be pursuing with another doctor or are there some general tests just to, to get, you know, understand the general health of your heart that I'm not doing damage unknowingly to it by taking this medication? Um, I, I don't know if I'm being clear, but um, it's a vascular constrictor because it's for migraines. I take it like 10 and times. And here's my answer. Yeah. Next question. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, Here's the thing. So you're asking a great question, right? Let me say this. Sometimes people say things and there's no basis in fact for them. It's just a simple fact, okay? So you say, well, you shouldn't be taking that because of your heart, right? Maybe you shouldn't, but maybe it's okay. So is it okay to have a, you know, a 10 out of 10 migraine every day? Maybe, no. Yes, maybe no, but here's what I would want to know if it were me, okay? And these are the things I'd want to look at. I'd want to know about the vasculature of your brain, right? I'd want to know about, you know, the blood vessels in your brain, because if the blood vessels in your brain constrict, well, there's less blood flow. It could also make them more prone to a clot. It could also make them more prone to a bleed or a hemorrhage, right? So I'd want to know that. Am I at risk for a stroke? Okay. I'd want to know about your carotid arteries. And there are arteries, there are tests that you could do. You could have a carotid duplex or you could have an ultrasound of your carotid arteries because if, if these constrict or you have plaque there and something flicks off, that could also go to your brain. And if the, car, if, the, if the arteries in your brain are constricted, well, guess what? That's like a four lane highway becomes a two lane highway. And now we got a double park car, also higher risk of stroke, okay? But I told you before that you know, blood pressure is a function of cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. The peripheral resistance has to do with your vessels constricting and dilating, right? So if you're taking a vasoconstrict, and I don't know much about Imitrex at all. So let me preface with that. That's not gonna stop me from giving you an answer, okay? But I'm not gonna give you an answer that has anything to do with Imitrex, okay? But if Imitrex is truly a, a, a vasoconstrictor, then there's ways to know. So if, you're, if, you, if you started taking Imitrex, and your blood pressure is 40 points higher on Imitrex than it is uh, off Imitrex, well, that's something to consider. But if your headaches are so bad that, you know, ah, oh, it's killing me and I feel like killing myself, which, you know, some people have migraines that are, they, I've, I've heard of people who it's so horrible that maybe there's something that can offset the Imitrex because maybe Imitrex is the only thing that can stop your headaches, in which case, there are other medications that are vasodilators. So I'm not saying like swallow the spider to catch the fly, swallow the bird to catch the spider to catch the fly, but I'm saying these are things that there are answers to. So like every question that somebody asked tonight, I don't necessarily know the answer, but I know there are answers out there that can be found if you have a doctor who's diligent and interested. And, I, and this would be a cardiologist I should see. For I would start with a cardiologist yeah. and I would also look to a neurologist. Okay, thank you. Sure. One minute to go. Final question. Who wants I, it? I, me. Lynn, you already asked me 27 questions. Come on. No, <laughs> wait, 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 Lynn. Wait one second. I'm going to give you one. Anyone else have a question? Uh, Tom, and then yeah. and then we'll yield to the senator from from, from <laughs> here to see Lynn Northrop. But go ahead. I'll give you so one. When I exercise, my heart rate is like 120 to 160. I just recently got put on bisoprol. And it, okay, it's like one, problem, yeah. it's like one ten. It, it's a, like, is that normal? Like, it can't get the heart rate up. So okay, so um, exercise. You know, blood pressure of one twenty to one. You said one twenty to one sixty, right? A heart rate. Heart like, rate. Ex All right. Exercising how old heart rate. How old are you? Fifty. Do you have any other heart? Uh, any other uh, risk factors? Do you have high cholesterol? Uh, uh um. Not really. I'm on. I am on Lipitor, but it's preventative. You have high blood pressure. Yeah. Okay. Do you have diabetes? Yeah. Do you have a family history of heart disease? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So you have a lot of risk factors. Okay. Um, so what I would say is you're taking a beta blocker, right? right. Now there's a lot of a lot of ways that uh, you can control blood pressure, right? Which is why I assume you're taking the bisoprolol, right? To yeah. control your blood pressure. So bisoprolol is a beta blocker, which means in addition to lowering your blood pressure, it also lowers your heart rate. And in some people, it creates like what you described as a ceiling, 
right? So it's like, no matter what, my heart rate won't go above 110 on bisoprolol. And depending upon the workload that you're going through and depending upon the amount of exercise that you want to do, you may not be able to meet the cardiac output demands. And so you may be having a downside of not being able to exercise as hard because your heart rate is not able to get high enough. So the question I would ask your doctor is, I would say exactly that. I'd say, look, I'm on this because my heart rate goes to 120 to 160, which at, at, 50, years of old, at 50 years of age is actually not even that bad. That's not something I would be worried about, especially 160 if you're exercising vigorously. Yeah. So, you know, there's about a dozen classes of blood pressure medication that maybe your blood pressure can be controlled with something that's not going to have that heart rate effect. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. And finally, the Senator from New York City, Lynn Northrup, what's your last question? Make it a good one. That, what is a vascular neuro, I had a TIA, and one of the things that was suggested along with seeing a cardiologist was seeing a vascular neurologist. And I, I don't really know what they do. So I actually don't eat a vascular neurologist. So, okay, vascular has to do with the blood vessels. Neurology okay. is, you know, the nervous system. Um, I haven't particularly heard of that specialty myself. Um, but what did you say you had? You had what? A TIA? A TIA. So, yeah. So you need, so you need, a, you know, you need a doctor who's a neurologist, right? Because they're going to look at your brain. A TIA is a stroke. Right. Um, right. I take it back. Not a stroke. It's a mini stroke. Well, it's a transient ischemic attack. So let me draw right. a parallel. So that means that there was a time when your brain was not getting enough blood flow and enough oxygen, but it's reversible, right? So the a TIA is to the brain what uh, angina is to the heart, right? And we don't want you to have a stroke. Um, so a neurologist can treat that and a, probably a vascular doctor could treat that too. I would think there's a lot Either. of people that can treat that. You know, I think there's multiple specialties that could treat that. I'm not necessarily sure that, you know, I don't know. I haven't heard of that specific specialty of vascular neurologist, but you know, for a TIA, you go to a, a neurologist because you want to treat the nervous system in the brain and you want to treat the vasculature. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap. Thank, Thank you very you much for time. being here tonight and uh, stay healthy, stay safe. On our website, there are a ton of webinars. There's hundreds of hours. There's free boot camp. There's free book. There's podcasts. www.pulmonarywellness.org if you're interested in coming to h and Physical Therapy, 815 Second Avenue, seventh floor, one person in the elevator at a time, wash your hands. Um, the, the phone number, 212-499-0181, is that it? Oh no, 0848, 0848, right? 212-499-0848 um, and www.hdphysicaltherapy.com. And this guy right here, Greg Hullstrung, he is the H in H and D. And that's it. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye, Noah.